Well, we turn again to the uh, fight of faith. This evening we focus on the, the helmet of salvation. I could call tonight's uh, message uh, Christian Composure, having a clear head, a calm heart and a steady will. And I think all those things are necessary to a soldier uh, and especially a Christian soldier in the army of the Lord Jesus. So our text then is Ephesians 6 verse 17. We're having spoken of the breastplate of righteousness and the footwear of the Christian and the shield of faith. Now we focus on the, the helmet of salvation, the helmet of salvation. So there'll be two main heads this evening. First of all, the priority of the mind, and then secondly, the protection of the mind. But uh, we begin with an introduction. Paul turns our attention to the Roman soldier's helmet. In a crouched position, it would be possible for the whole body to be hidden from the vision of an attacker. However, our soldier needs to see his enemy. Hence, he must be confident that, as he looks at him, his head is protected. A leather, brass or steel helmet was intended to guard the wearer against blows from swords and battle axes. It thus gave confidence in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In Paul's mind, the helmet illustrates the hope of salvation, which is an expression he uses in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8. Now since no soldier can fight effectively without hope of victory, no Christian can fight the daily fight of faith without hope of salvation. To understand the helmet's spiritual significance, we need to consider the specific protection it offers. It obviously protects the eyes with a, a visor in later helmet designs, especially in the Middle Ages, and ears. It also protects the skull and hence the brain. The God-given built-in computer must function efficiently for a soldier to fight effectively. Every perception, action and movement depends upon it. And since the hope of salvation enables us to view the future with confidence, it must be based on present knowledge. Thus, the leading thought behind the helmet is the protection of the mind. As a head injury affects the whole man, so our minds need protection from Satan's attacks. So first of all then the priority of the mind. While our minds are filled with thoughts of our great salvation we're safe from the onslaughts of the enemy. Hence we read you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, a verse that we particularly love and have reasons to remember, the Basil text as we know it. And also the Apostle Peter says that we should gird up the loins of our mind, 1 Peter 1, 13. Elsewhere, Paul stresses the positive thinking of Christianity as a means of ensuring a sense of God's peace. We see that in Philippians chapter 4 and verses uh, 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be 
with you. This emphasis reminds us that we are to love God with our minds as well as our hearts. And the Lord Jesus made that point too, didn't he? In Matthew 22, his summary of the law, that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and our neighbour as ourselves. Indeed, conversion to Christ involves a transformation in our thinking. In Romans 12, 2, the Apostle is very careful to make that particular point where he says, Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this word, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then as we heard in our reading, Philippians 2 verse 5, we are exhorted to have the mind of Christ. It's surprising, therefore, in view of these references, that uh, anyone should ever doubt the importance of the mind in, <laughs> in our Christian experience. In order to have the mind of Christ, we need to know the Word of God, because it's the Word of God that gives us thoughts that are from God and are pleasing to God. Jesus makes that quite plain in John 14 and verse 23 where he says these important things. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So victory is lost when our understanding lacks biblical knowledge. Right doctrine is vital for right living. A wrong head will lead us in the wrong direction. Hence the New Testament letters begin with teaching, which is then followed by application. Doctrine guides practice. Thus a Christian who is well taught in the gospel is well protected against Satan's lies. Ignorant Christians are easy victims of deception and danger. The great themes of the epistle to the Romans are to be grasped by every warrior of Christ. Truths concerning sin, the law, God's grace, justification by faith, sanctification by the Holy Spirit, assurance through the Holy Spirit, and sovereign divine grace. The gospel supplies the Christian's daily rations and battle orders. Our minds must be in harmony with God's truth if our lives are to be in step with his will, as we saw again in the opening verses of Romans 12. A sound grasp of God's word is the best antidote to false religion and superstition, and the world is full of that these days, sadly, as biblical teaching from the churches is not what it once was or should be. The Lord Jesus warned the disciples frequently against the traditionalism of the Pharisees and the liberalism of the Sadducees. In Mark chapter 7, he particularly castigates those who were more wedded to their traditions than they were to the word of God. And there Jesus quotes from Isaiah 29, verse 13, where the Lord complained in Isaiah's day that this people draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We must neither add to the scriptures, which is what the Pharisees did, nor subtract from the scriptures, which is what the Sadducees did. A true Christian soldier will say like Martin Luther, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Sadly, 
much modern Christianity overstresses emotion at the expense of thought. Feeling comes before thinking. Too many Christians are preoccupied with the subjective aspects of the Christian life to the neglect of the objective features of the faith. But this is to reverse God's order. He first reveals truth to the mind in order that it might influence the heart and then the will. Ignorance is bondage, but truth brings freedom, which is exactly what Jesus says in John 8. He says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Then in verse 36, if the Son sets you free, then you shall be free indeed. In other words, there's only liberty of soul from sin and all its effects in the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth that he conveys to us. There must, of course, be balance. Someone might be thinking, well, what about our feelings then? OK, well, this is the answer to that question. It has been rightly said that too much emphasis on doctrine and you dry up. Too much stress on experience and you blow up. A right combination of both and you grow up. In other words, we must avoid being preoccupied with our own inward states of mind and heart and be governed by the great objective facts of the faith, which is what the Apostle Paul was very concerned to emphasise to Timothy in Second Timothy and uh, chapter 1. Verse 7, this is what he said. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Satan attacks our minds either by proposing false doctrine or by oppressing us to be obsessed with self. We must look to God's word. That then shows the importance, the, the priority of the mind. Which leads on secondly to the protection of the mind. Since the helmet protects the eyes and the ears, we must also be careful about what we see and hear. Satan is a master deceiver. False information is everywhere today. This is the the fake news era. The world follows an anti-Christian agenda. People are exploited by social media and also mainstream media. Advertising is often highly suspect. Education is not based on Christian truth and values. Thus, on the basis of God's inspired, inerrant word, the Bible, which we know is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 We must test everything we see and hear. God loves the truth, said John Calvin, and set so great store by it that he will have us stick to it, whatsoever comes of it. And if we see that men set themselves against the doctrine which we know to be true, let us resist them to the uttermost of our power. Wearing the helmet of salvation will thus preserve us from soul-destroying falsehood. The certain hope of salvation will sustain us in the battle against Satan's brainwashing techniques and propaganda. Let us resist him depending on God's truth, grace and power. And we ought to be very clear on the power of our enemy. We shouldn't make jokes about the devil, as some people tend to do. Look what we read in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 6 and 7. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, 
that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Then he goes on. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you, to him be the glory and the dominion for ever and ever. Amen. We will thus retain our sanity and our salvation and rejoice in God's victory. There's an important postscript to apply all this to what we currently are bombarded with in these days. Indeed, we're bombarded by a relentless barrage of errors. For example, Islam, the cults, charismania, secularism in its many expressions, namely atheism, hedonism, which is pleasure-loving th- um, lifestyle, sexual perversions, abortion, evolutionism, racism, and so forth. They are everywhere. A recent example, the canonization of Cardinal John Henry Newman, who defected from the Church of England to the Roman Catholic Church in 1845, illustrates the need for sound biblical doctrine. The whole concept of canonization is an example of fake Christianity. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, endorsed the delusion by agreeing to preach at Westminster Roman Catholic Cathedral in a spirit of ecumenical celebration. Just as the erring Apostle Peter needed correction by the Apostle Paul, so today's ecumenists need to be challenged. I withstood Peter to his face, said Paul, because he was to be blamed. He and others were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. That's quite a striking statement. That's in Galatians 2, 11 and 14. What then is the authentic Christian view of sainthood? Well, according to the scriptures, a saint is a sinner saved by grace, one set apart for the service and worship of God. Now, saint is a common term for Christian. You find in Romans 1.7, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, and Philippians 4.21 and 2, uh, the word saint is used simply as a term for a, a believer in Christ. And translated from the Greek hagios, it indicates a transforming holiness enjoyed by true believers in Christ, without which one cannot be a Christian. It is something started in this life, not just a perfect attainment at death. So, if one doesn't live and die as a saint, no God-approved, church-initiated, afterlife process exists to start what never began on earth. And that's what the Roman Church claims to be able to do. If certain tests are applied to certain um, spiritual people, uh, they can then be uh, upgraded, if you like, to become a saint. But in their terms, you've got to be dead before you become a saint. One sometimes hears the honest confession, I'm no saint. If it simply means I'm not perfect, then no mere mortal deserves the title. However, While growth in personal holiness is a necessary feature of the Christian life, perfection is never attained in this life. It is never taught in the New Testament that saints are perfect believers. Our saintliness is defined in terms of being righteous and holy in Christ Jesus, as Paul explains in Ephesians 1, verses 1 to 4. 
and being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. In short, a saint is one who is justified and sanctified. Being justified means to be declared righteous by the remission of sins through faith in the blood of Christ, as Paul teaches in Romans 4 and Romans 5. Now, while good works are a necessary and certain fruit of saving faith, Paul describes faith in Galatians 5-6 as faith which works by love. And in Ephesians 2, Paul's very careful to say, By grace are you saved, through faith of that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has before ordained that we should walk in them. But their imperfection rules them out from justifying us. Our persons and our performances alike <coughs> always require pardon. That said, Christian sainthood is the present status of true, though imperfect, believers, not that of dead believers canonised by the Church of Rome. So such will be the correct understanding of one who is wearing the helmet of salvation. Yes, a helmet, not a fashionable fascinator. We either follow God's infallible word or Rome's false tradition. Faithfully receiving God's revealed truth, we will enjoy the clarity and comfort of the soul-saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again those two references from John's Gospel. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And the hymn writer Charles Wesley expresses this so well. When e'er in error's paths we rove, the living God through sin forsake, our conscience, by thy word, reprove. Convince and bring the wanderers back, deep wounded by thy spirit's sword, and then by Gilead's balm restored. So what's this saying? Well, the Christian life, yes, the, the true saintly life, is a case of a life of progress, but sometimes we take two steps forward and perhaps three steps back, uh, of rise and fall. Sometimes we make progress in the Christian life, other times we fall and we fail. So all the way through the life of a true saint, uh, we always need repentance and forgiveness. We need to be convicted of our sins and to confess them afresh, even day by day, and then again to receive the pardoning blessing of the blood of Christ and the grace of God. That's why the last two lines of that Charles Wesley verse say so much so beautifully. When we're deep wounded by thy spirit's sword, and then by Gilead's balm restored. That's the true saintly life of the real Christian. And all this will be true for us in our experience and in our thinking and in our living when we're wearing the helmet of salvation. Well, I hope that gives you food for thought and for meditation and to help you in your, your Christian life. Well, let's sing, shall we, that last hymn. It's hymn 328 in the hymn book. I quoted in the study, um, verse 3. But it's a great hymn. Hymn 328, inspire of the ancient seers who wrote from thee the sacred page. The same through all succeeding years to us in our degenerate age. 
the spirit of thy word impart and breathe the life into our heart. Let's sing then from verse 2 to the end. <coughs> One of thy oracles we read with earnest prayer and strong desire. Oh, let thy spirit from thee proceed, our souls to awaken and inspire. Our weakness help, our darkness chase, and guide us by the light of grace. When in error's paths we rove, the living God through sin forsake. Our conscience by thy word reprove, convince and bring the wanderers back. Deep wounded by thy spirit sword, and then by Gilead's balm restored. The sacred lessons of thy grace Transmitted through thy word repeat And train us up in all thy ways To make us in thy will complete Fulfill thy love's redeeming plan and bring us to a perfect man. Furnish that of thy treasury, O oh, may we always ready stand. To help the souls redeemed by thee in what their various states demand. To teach, convince, correct, reprove, and build them up in holiest love. Our loving and gracious Father, we thank you for all the provision that you have made for us in the Christian warfare. There is no reason for us to fall and to fail. You have given us all that we need to stand by your grace, to fight manfully under your banner against the world, the flesh and the devil. But Lord, we confess that we are weak. Sometimes we do fall and fail. And therefore not a day passes but that we need again to look to the cross of Calvary, to be cleansed afresh by the precious blood of Christ, to be renewed again by your Holy Spirit, and to be up upon our feet again, fighting the battle and growing in grace. Help us therefore, dear Father, we pray, to the glory of your name, to the extension of your kingdom, and that since we are not fighting this battle alone, but we have fellow warriors, brothers and sisters. May we therefore, Lord, pray for one another and encourage one another. And all, dear Lord, to your glory and to your praise. And all these mercies we humbly ask with thanksgiving in our Saviour's worthy name.